We're here in Cochiti Pueblo Reservation now. We're gonna go uh, stop by Virgil Ortiz's house, check out his studio, see what he's got going on over there. Dad's house right here. I collect a lot of my uh, grandmother's pieces and my, our, our mother's pieces. Growing up, I never knew that it was a form of art just because it was always around, like done on the uh, dining room table. And I just kind of thought everybody did it. But when I grew up and knew better, then I found out that it was special. So, But I try to collect as much as pieces as I can, like even historic pieces like this here. Those two in the back, but the rest would be like my, my those, mother's. Those look really old. Yeah, those are like from the 1800s. So I'm trying to collect as much because as soon as I open the foundation, I'll have pieces that the kids can actually handle and study. The pieces that you create now are, are, are pretty similar to that. That's oh, they're all based on it's it because it's, they, yeah. it's all based on social commentary. They created all the interesting people that were new to them and recorded them and made caricatures of them. So. That's what the whole line of Coach D Pottery is based on. So and it's done exactly the same. Yeah, manner. with all the same, same, me same methods and materials, and the only thing that has changed is just time and subject matter. So, so one of these, one of these started back then is the same as it is now in terms of you start a project and you don't stop until it's finished completely. Yeah, to to mold a piece like say this size here, which is what like maybe uh, thirteen inches, maybe or 14 inches, like I would have to sculpt it, providing that we have all the materials all prepared, um, which will take probably about a week in itself to get everything ready to go. Also, you have to have a breathing hole and you can't make them solid because they're too heavy and most likely we'll have a, a bubble and an air pocket in there so when you fire it, it'll blow up. It'll take me like maybe eight hours to do a size like this. The, then you have to wait for it to dry, which is another week. Once you sand it, water it down, stick it in the oven, and then we take a white clay, which is this here, which is all traditional, and it's just a white clay. And the consistency is like milk. And we do like eight coatings, pop it in, take it out, pop it in, and cover it, and then eventually the whole piece is turns white, and the firing is the last process. So we decorate it with a, another red uh, clay paint, and also the black paint we have to make out of wild spinach. We, ha we have the whole family do that, because it takes forever to gather the plant and we usually get it as soon as the the it starts blooming so what we have to do is completely get all the kids and we have to pick just the leaves we tried to do the stems and all to make it with it but it doesn't work so there's no shortcuts around that so we get the the leaves maybe like six garbage like 33 gallon size garbage bags full of it as soon as we get that take it outside and we boil them in really huge pots for probably about four to five days and just keep boiling it, boiling it until finally, like maybe after the fifth day, then we strain the, the leaves out from it. And you'll see all kinds of designs like, you know, representing like what the, the wild spinach plant looks like. And like that design is actually our family's design. So awesome. you'll see it everywhere. And then at a certain point we add sugar to it and then it'll caramelize it, and then it'll get it really thick, and as soon as that happens, then you have to wa really watch it carefully. Then we have corn husks just all laying out, so then we just, when we know it's the right consistency, then slowly start pouring it on there, and just let it dry, so there's our paint. So every time we start painting, we'll crack it up, w wet it down, and then that's what we use to, to paint the black on. Like say this one and, and that guy there. We could totally fire those together, but if they're all different sizes like this, then they have to be fired separately just because the heat has to hit it uniformly. So all we do is just set it on a piece of tin and then we set a rock on it so it'll be steady, a flat rock, and then put the piece on there and then build like a, a cage over it out of chicken wire. And then we, once it's like a, we built like a, a little igloo around it, then we put the cow patties around it and that's what will just protect it from the direct contact of the fire or smoke. And then line up whatever uh, wood we're using. We like to use aspen because it doesn't pop as much. Ignite it and then it burns from the outside in. Wow. And um, you could also use tin also to cover around it, but 
I find out I found out that it kind of makes it more gray, so we prefer to use the the cow pies. Um, it burns about 45 minutes, and then hopefully if you don't hear no popping sounds, then you know you're halfway halfway there. And then after it burns out, then you let it cool down, and it's still it's all intact. So you know just leave it alone till you don't want any of the ashes to fall on it while it's still hot. And we've been using the white clay slip, you know, like from our grandmother's days. And um, sometimes they come up pure white. Sometimes they come out really, um, really beige like that. Sometimes they come out gray. You can, you never know what, so, so what color. So each piece is unique in its yeah, own Yeah, right. completely unique. Aside from new tools and new techniques, about 80% of it, 90% of it is still traditionally. Yeah, you never, I mean, all these ones here are all traditional. I mean, there's, you can, you can use, um, store-bought paint or store-bought clay, but it's not going to have yeah. the, the same feeling, you know. And like all the prayers that go into it while we're making the traditional mm -hmm. ones, you know, it makes a lot of a difference. But when the satisfaction is, is when you actually get it out of the, out, out of the, the firing pit and you're like, okay, it's all intact. No matter if it has a little, like a, the flyer, fire clouds there, how you see it. A lot of the collectors don't like that, but you know, we're taught to um, accept that as part of the of the pottery itself. You know, because your your art sells pretty well. You know, you mm -hmm. you, may, you create a piece of pottery and it and it goes. Yeah. But you're not creating pottery every day. You're no. just you're doing what you. I mean, we're raised and taught to like only use it if your brother or sister need it, if your nieces or nephews or families need like help in financially, and then that's when we do it, or either for shows. So. Mm -hmm. And I tried to slow down on, on making them because I don't want to flood the market at all. Mm -hmm. So that's why I branched out into fashion and jewelry and uh, painting, uh, what else, photography, and the carpet. So um, it kind of balances everything out and they influence each other. So. You could just spend so much energy and so much time mm -hmm. creating a piece and already have hours and hours and hours invested into it and then it just, and then it just breaks. Yeah, cracks, and then you have to start all over. Yeah, and then like once it once it does that, then we usually take it down to the river and bury it, and you know give it back to uh, mm -hmm. uh, the the earth. So, mm -hmm. and and I noticed when I was walking around market, I seen other pottery pieces by other pueblos, and, and Cochiti is really um, has its own unique style, and it's yeah, it's very it's Cochiti was the first one to do storytellers and this kind of figurative pottery. Mm -hmm. So, and Cochiti is kind of in the center of all the um, the northern and the southern pueblos. So. I guess it probably just kind of spread out from here. Um, but then there's the northern pueblos that do the highly polished uh, pottery, which is are beautiful, and that's their way also. But Cochiti is probably mainly known for its um, figurative style pottery. That's amazing. Those pieces, you could just feel the power in them. It's, just like, yeah. It's powerful. Like and, just, and who knows what grandma or grandpa made those. I mean, imagine those from 1800s, dude. And that's the only way I'll feel successful is if, if the tradition of pottery making stays alive. Because mm -hmm. there's there's just very few families that do it right now. Wow, and that's kind of one of the main things you're working on with the kids. Yeah. So as soon as the foundation starts, we're gonna bring in the kids, maybe three. I mean, I don't know if I can handle more than that. Just when we're when we're starting 